The lectionary that we follow uh, offers uh, two tracks for about half the year. Beginning after Pentecost, uh, there's track one and track two for the Old Testament reading. Uh, th one track offers you a semi-continuous reading of the Old Testament, and that's the track that we use here at Grace and Holy Trinity. I think it's important for us not to just kind of pluck around the Old Testament all year long, but to hear the Old Testament readings within context and with some continuity. The track two option uses the older method, uh, which is that the Old Testament is lined up, or at least they try to, with the gospel. What's interesting on this Sunday is that the semi-continuous reading, which has us reading Ruth, the end of Ruth, last week we read, we read the first chapter of Ruth. This week, uh, we're in the last chapter of Ruth. What's interesting is the semi-continuous really lines up quite nicely with the gospel. Because in both of these stories, we have a story of widows. As we've discussed before, widows uh, in ancient times were extremely vulnerable, right? Women had no rights outside of their husbands or fathers or the nearest kinsmen in a patriarchal society. So to be a widow, uh, if you had some wealth, that might protect you a little bit, but even with wealth, you weren't protected. A widow was very vulnerable, and particularly vulnerable if no kinsman stepped up to the plate to offer her protection. And so we have in Ruth the story of Naomi, who has been widowed, and uh, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, uh, who has now been widowed after having married Naomi's son. And then we have in the gospel reading, we have a widow coming to the temple treasury. The story of Ruth is one of my favorite stories. And the reason it's one of my favorite stories is it's a story about Jesus' Jesus's lineage. Ruth is one of Jesus' great, great, great times great grandmothers. And what I love about in the story of Ruth is that it's a story of two women kind of overcoming and making their way through. But also the thing that I love about the story of Ruth is had we read the other chapters, what we would have heard over and over again is Ruth the Moabite. The great redeemer of Israel is descended from a foreign woman, from an immigrant woman, to a woman who is a convert to the Jewish faith. She is not born into it. And yet this is part of Jesus' great line, his great lineage, that in particular in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew begins with Jesus' lineage, and it echoes the end of Ruth, of where it talks about that Boaz and Ruth, right? It says their children. They named their son Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. In just a couple of weeks, right, we'll hear Jesse's name repeated over and over again in a lot of the music during Advent as well as David. The great salvation of Israel descends from an immigrant woman, a widow, a vulnerable woman. In the gospel, we have the example of of a widow who comes to the temple treasury. Now, what's interesting in this is Jesus is not condemning the temple. Sometimes it can be interpreted that way, but he's not condemning the idea that you should be contributing to the temple. What he is condemning, though, is the way in which people go about it, that they're all show and no heart. I mean, imagine in a couple of minutes when we do the offertory, if it's olden days, right, you don't have a checkbook, you can't uh, give online to the church. So you come with coins in a sack. And as you put that into the offering plate, we would all know how much you were giving by how big your sack was that you placed in the offertory plate. And you could do this so when you go to the temple treasury, you could walk with it in your hand, real showy, 
or you could hide it in your pocket. And what appears to have been the tradition, a lot of folks would, would really brag on their way to the temple. Look how much I'm bringing to the temple. And Jesus notices this widow woman, as we've discussed before, a, a, a widowed woman would have otherwise been ignored in society at this time. And he says, you see her? She's the example. I love that this reading came up during our pledge drive. <laughs> but I don't think for why you think. <laughs> Since I have arrived, my heart has been saddened to hear from some of you that my gift is not large enough and it does not matter to this place. As your rector and as your pastor, I am so glad that this reading came up today because when you give out of your abundance, no matter what it is, Christ notices. God notices. We notice here. I don't think that you all feel that way because people are flaunting their wealth. I think that you feel that way because you wish that you could give more. And there's a certain shame in those conversations that I hear with some of you. Many of you, uh, too many of you, made the comment to me when we were doing the renovation over the summer to say, I can't really give a big gift and I don't know if it'll really make a difference. On Friday, I met with the chair of our finance committee, Mike Joyce, and I can assure you that every time Mike and I meet, we are looking for every $50, for every $100 in that budget. Because every one of those adds up. The average gift to this church is a couple of thousand dollars, not tens of thousands but a couple of thousand. You are giving out of your abundance, and God notices that and honors that. You go, well, a hundred dollars. I mean, what can Grace and Holy Trinity really do with a hundred dollars? In a couple of weeks, we'll hear testimonies from folks who are involved with Red Door. They do a lot with a hundred dollars. If I tell Kate and Kyle in our children and youth ministries that they have another $100 to spend, they'll spend it before they leave my office on our children and youth. They need every penny that we can give them. It all adds up. That's the point of God's kingdom, is that when we all give out of our abundance, whatever our abundance is, there is a lot, right? In a couple of weeks, it'll be Thanksgiving. And if everybody brings a little something, before you know it, you have food for 20, 30, and 40. My friends, the point of these two readings is that you are not reduced to your lineage and you are not reduced to your pocketbook. On one side of my family, I have these great stories of coming to Virginia summer after summer, where my grandfather would do genealogy research because his family came here beginning in the 1640s. But on my mother's side of the family, my great-great-grandmother was a Japanese orphan. And I'll never know more of her story. I don't really know more than her American name. You see, none of us are the sum of that lineage. None of us is the sum of our checking account. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to baptize Ann Barrett as a child of God. We are going to claim what has been hers since the moment she took breath. Who you are and the value of who you are completely rests in the fact that you were made in the image and likeness of the Creator, that you were redeemed by His Son, and that you are guided by His Spirit. That's who you and I are. That's who these widows are. They are the mighty daughters of the Most High. Just like Ann Barrett, and just like you and I.
Amen.